Cheers, TFB. You want to learn about the drawer? Let's learn about the drawer. So, the drawer light machine gun. Fascinating, interesting design from Israel, 1950s, interested with Johnson. We're going to get to that in a second. First off, I really want to thank one of our sponsors, Venture Munitions. Help us a lot with the channel. Get these sort of videos out to you about some really cool stuff. Boom, the drawer. So, first off, the drawer, there's, some limit, there's very limited resources that talk in depth about the drawer. There's two, however, or well, actually three that I would really definitely recommend. First of all, Ian's got a very well done video, but Ian is an awesome guy. He's got a very good video on Forgotten Weapons about the drawer as well. You know, give his video a look out uh, in addition to this one if you're interested. And he goes in depth for a couple of different things, but I'm going to try to fill some of the gaps that Ian probably um, doesn't pick up on. And so hopefully with both these videos, we can get a nice solid round look at the drawer light machine gun in use by Israel. But first of all, so far as resources to learn about the drawer, um, Bruce Canfield has a book out about the Johnson light machine gun rifle and company and the guy's life as well. He has an excellent uh, portion on the drawer where he covers it quite well. More importantly, this appears to be the only resource that we have where um, the where an Israeli version of the Johnson semi-automatic rifle was uh was produced let me see if i can get that in focus there only about five or so were produced and canfield has a photograph in here of the actual rifle which is pretty neat not many people know about it realize it even exists it was an israeli version of the johnson rifle in israel um second of all we've got two resources on small arms defense journal that talk in depth about the sort of clandestine covert foundings of the drawer which is really interesting what we're going to talk about a lot of today uh, give them a shout out as well. I'll put screen grabs up of them on the screen too. So anyways, the drawer. What does drawer mean? What does it stand for? Drawer stands for either sparrow or freedom. Yeah, sparrow or freedom, depending on how you interpret it. Apparently, I think it's a biblical word in Hebrew. Um, it's actually it's actually still used a lot in Hebrew. There's organizations today called drawer or something like that. I'm, I'm not the Israel expert here, all right? But anyways, so the drawer came out of the necessity in the 19, late 1940s, before the State of Israel was formed in 1947-48, there's a British mandate in Palestine or Philistine, and the British end up leaving. Um, Arab armies start closing in on Israel. You know, Israel has to defend itself. Regardless, you have the Haganah, right, which is the Israeli sort of defense forces at the time that were guarding various kibbutz communities across the, the country. Well, the, the, the soon-to-be country, territory. And anyways, they had to defend themselves. They needed guns. They needed lots of guns. You know, they imported a lot of stuff, surplus stuff from Europe, from actually, of all places, Nazi Germany, um, leftover MG34s, leftover stuff like that. You know, I'm going to throw up a picture on here of Haganah fighters with a Lewis gun and a ground roll. They needed stuff. They needed small arms armament. So anyways, we have this fellow named Carl Ekdahl, who was a very close friend and one of the founding members of Johnson Automatics. Carl Ekdahl was very sympathetic to the Israeli, the Jewish cause at the time. So this guy uh, retired from Johnson Automatics, working with Johnson, who, if you're not familiar with the Johnson, give them a look. Uh, I think we have a video on TFB, as, uh, on TFB TV as well, where um, we do a running gun with the Johnson rifle. Um, we don't have anything yet on the machine gun, but we do have the drawer. So, anyways, he's with the he's with Johnson Automatics. After the war, he retires from Johnson Automatics. He's a little sick, that sort of thing. But he's sympathetic to the Jewish cause that's going on. And there was a huge movement within uh, the United States of sympathetic uh, Jews who are wanting to provide weapons, armament, and supplies for you know the Haganah across across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, about this, check out another book called The Pledge. I haven't even read it, but I'm seeing it pop up throughout this whole drawer research. And The Pledge is about this movement within the United States to supply weapons and ammunition to the Haganah. So Carl meets with some pro-Jewish guys in New York, actually in a cheap hotel room, and he brings along with him a, an early prototype model of a Johnson light machine gun, which goes to show that this Carl guy was very close friends with Melvin Johnson. How did he get that prototype if there's very few around? You know, this is where people start saying, well, was how, how, how involved was Johnson in these transactions? We know that, you know, this early prototype was given. We know that Johnson Automatics went bankrupt in 1949, but then, you know, the production starts of the drawer in about 1950, 1951, well, well, earlier, but it starts really getting issued out to units in 51 and 52. So, you know, 
Automat Dark Johnson on goes out of business. The drawer comes into production. Was there a connection? We don't know. Some people know. There were visits between Johnson to Israel around the time. Um, at the same time, Johnson was looking out for contracts in Iran, um, South America of all places, in Egypt as well. Either way, we don't know if there's a connection between Johnson and Israel um, as we know it. But there definitely is one with this Carl guy. So Carl works with these sort of underground uh, Jewish resistance supporters in, in the United States and New York, uh, gets them, you know, gets them the blueprints, gets them some basic parts. And what he does is they take all these parts and they actually go to Toronto and Canada and they actually start putting parts together in Canada and then shipping them contraband across the ocean to Israel. There's a couple points where you can read about in Sage where they almost got caught multiple times by the Canadian police forces and also with the fact that the Jewish community in Toronto apparently wasn't too thrilled about these guys putting light machine guns together in their backyard. So eventually we have this process of packing in Toronto, sending them over to Israel. In Israel, actually one of the founding members of one of the Israeli uh, rifles, uh, uh, Galil, actually worked on the parts as they came across. And these machine gun parts were put together in Israel and several things happened. So first of all, the early model drawers, the Type 1, I guess you could call it, was actually a converted model 1944 Johnson um, in 303 with a really heavy curved magazine um, for the curvature of the taper of the, of the rim 303 round. They were having a lot of issues with it. It didn't work out very well at all. And they changed the caliber later on, but it wasn't due to the fact that the 303 wasn't working out as much. It was more due to the fact that there is a crazy amount of surplus 8mm ammunition that was then available in Israel coming over from Europe. And it was really cheap and it was really plentiful. So some of the designers back in Israel told the guys back in Toronto, it's like, hey, you need to redraw these plans up and make it uh, 8mm. So they did that and they changed a couple other things on the gun. They moved the most importantly, they moved the magazine from a curved uh, inserted from the left. They turned it into a box magazine, very similar to the BAR magazine, but not a BAR magazine. And they took that and then they stuck it on the bottom. So it was a bottom feed. A couple of other dif differences is they added a barrel changing lever that was a part of the front sight post, which in the video that we have, in Ian's video, he just pops the thing right off. But for us at the Institute of Military Technology, it was very difficult to pop it off because it had been a little bit rusted in place. And the drawer we were dealing with was built on a drawer parts kit from Ohio Ordnance in Ohio. So it was a semi-automatic version, not a fully automatic version, unfortunately. They also had a sort of barrel handle just before the muzzle where you could pop the front sight post uh, portion off and then you could grab this portion of the barrel and then twist it out. Very intuitive. Uh, I don't know if I'd want to be getting my hands that close to the muzzle after being shot for a number of rounds, but it was an interesting system. And essentially, if you look at the 1944 Johnson, they essentially took the barrel latch retaining lever and then they switched it upside down. So it was on top of the barrel instead of on the bottom. Another big difference were the bipods. Uh, if you know your Johnsons, the 1941 and 1944 versions, didn't, they, they had this sort of half monopod, half bipod. Well, anyways, the 303 drawer incorporated an actual bipod that was a part of it. And then finally, there was a carrying handle that could be folded up or down or out of the way. So other than some of the things I just talked about, the rest of the features of the drawer are essentially one and the same with the 1944 Johnson. I mean, you've got this safety that's on the right side. That's a three position, a semi um, safe, semi and automatic. You got the rear sight that graduates to several hundred yards that flips up and down into a stowage position. The operating mechanism is a short recoil system exactly the same as the Johnson 1944 where the barrel has to recoil just a little bit to allow the bolt to unlock and then chamber the next round. One other thing that was added was a dust cover for the magazine. So you could actually, so when the LMG wasn't actually in use, you could actually flip this little dust cover doodad over the magazine well and then have it safe for travel if you were working to do that. The bipods could be flipped either forwards or backwards in different locked positions. And they also had a sling swivel. In our case, it's on the left side, but in some other photographs I've seen, it appears to be on the right side. It appears you could either push the sling swivel to the left or the right. In addition, the gun could be swiveled left and right on the actual bipod. So it could be pushed to the left or pushed to the right. 
This assembly of the thing is the exact same thing as the M1944. You simply separate the two receiver pieces, then you take out the bolt and spring from inside, and then now you've got the two parts open for cleaning. Anyways, back to the story of the drawer. Was it actually used in this, you know, crucial war for independence that, you know, Israel was going through with the Haganah and various forces around then? And this is sort of the, the irony of this whole matter is that there's all these plans to bring the drawer into action. There's all these plans, you know, to bring it to bear, to, you know, get it over to Israel. They need guns tomorrow. Like they need guns today. Da, da, da. The drawer was never actually used in the Israeli War for Independence. The Israeli War for Independence happened in 1948. The drawer never even entered service until 1951 and 52. And even when it did, there was only about 3,000 to 4,000 drawer light machine guns and 8mm Mauser that actually found their way into ID, essentially what would now be the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF. It essentially found themselves in the IDF use. Of those 3 to 4,000, the gun was not liked very much. It... It fired really badly. We've got an Israeli magazine article that mentions this from the test reports in that, you know, it was very it was very accurate on semi-automatic fire. But the second you turned it over to fully automatic, the thing would just apparently go everywhere. It would have, I think I've got a quote in here that says 30 inches at 200 yards or something. Like something just pretty unacceptable for the, for the other machine guns they were testing at the time, which would have been the uh, Bren gun and among others in the same sort of magazine fed class. In addition, it just really kicked really badly. And you can tell in Ian's video where he's talking about it, where he says, like, I get hit from the back, I get hit from the front. But that is backed up by various test reports that say, yeah, like, you know, the thing just really hurt to shoot. In addition, it did suffer from some reliability from sand and mud getting into the action. But anyways, who actually used this thing? Um, first on the list was the Israeli Navy. The Israeli Navy, however small it was in 1951, did adopt a number of drawers and they apparently had them in active service. Second off were these sort of border patrol, um, were these sort of border patrol units that they had then. They, they were a border control unit that did operations along the periphery of the country. Um, and third, it was used for training. It was used for training guys when they first went in the military. And apart from that, it didn't really see much service at all. This, you know, crazy, hard to get, covertly supplied light machine gun ended up being a complete waste of everybody's time in the end, unfortunately. Thanks very much for watching, guys. We really appreciate the viewership. We'd also really like to thank the Institute of Military Technology in Titusville, Florida, for allowing us to film interesting semi-automatic kit of the drawer from Ohio Ordnance.